Are you well? Yes, fine, thank you. Just uh, put a mic on you. We're surrounded by lots of books. Are you reading a lot, Martin? Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, a secret no longer well kept that uh, the writer's life divides into three segments. There's uh, writing, there's that thing called living, and also there's reading. And it's not only for information, but just to keep the words coming in. Words are your fuel. Martin, it's great to meet you. It's five minutes. So it's an unusual sort of interview for you. Time starts now. You're one of Britain's most celebrated authors. Did you always want to be a writer from a young age? Well, my theory about that is that um, everyone wants to be a writer. Around the age of 12, 13, when you start writing poems and keeping notebooks, diaries, you start you, this thing of communing with yourself. It's as if a voice has woken up inside you. And my theory is that the writers are just the ones who, who never grew out of that. Everyone, most other people moved on and put that aside, but the writers don't. Is it ever a struggle? Yeah, um, it's, it's a much more physical activity than people think. And you can be working away and then come up against something. And, and what, I, by now, I'm, you know, uh, I know what it is. It's, it's that you're running ahead of your unconscious. Sounds more complicated than it is, but what you've got to do really is walk away from your desk. And actually your feet will do it for you. You don't want to go to your desk. So you sit and read. Any head bashing? I, in, when I was younger, I used to s do a lot of that. But now I'm uh, hideously experienced, and I stroll away and read until my legs sort of take me back to my desk. Um, it's, it's, it's an emotional and physical activity as well as a cerebral one. Of course, you play a lot of tennis. Uh, not so much anymore. I do my sort of pathetic exercises. Um, there are, my father was a great believer in you know, going to walk, have a walk, post a letter, have a shave, turn away from it and then come back. Um, and that works, that'll give you a sort of a little break. But I, I feel that sometimes it, you know, you'll need two or three days away from your desk. I was, I was going to ask you actually about your father, because you've written a lot about him and the love you've had for him. He wasn't always terribly kind in his assessment of your novels, though, Kingsley Amos. No, he wasn't. But, um, but by mentioning that, I seem to have given the impression that it was a very difficult relationship. And it's only dawning on me um, just how exceptionally good a relationship it was. And he had also had a very good relationship with my brother and with my sister. Um, and uh, the reason for this, all my other friends struggled terribly with their fathers in their late teens. And I think it was because of what I'm writing about now, the, the sexual revolution, you know, whose first premise was there will be sex before marriage. Very bad news to those for whom there wasn't sex about marriage. Shattering news. And there was a lot of tension between fathers and sons to do with that. Never stated, of course, in those terms. But my father had already had that fight with his father and was not going to have it with us. And um, there was absolutely no... T he was sort of alarmingly permissive, really. Um, did, you have a, did you have a happy sort of balanced childhood? Because ju judging from your letters to your father and also to your stepmother, Elizabeth Jane Howard, you were very affectionate to both of them. Yeah, I, that was later on, but I mean, I always thought of myself as having had a, a happy childhood. And, and um, you know, homes are meant to be... Uh, you know, tar pits of resentments and rancors, and mine never felt like that. Now, you're very political. Since you got back from Uruguay, you joined the public debate about a whole range of issues. You've spoken a bit about Islam. Do you think there's a danger of self-censorship in the West when it comes to discussion of Islam? Well, clearly there is, and um, the, the, the battle over Salman Rushdie was won, but the war seems to be lost. Um, you know, everyone is walking on eggshells. You know, and we should respect that, and I think, the, you know, it's a great shame that the, the cartoons business, for instance, happened. I mean, once it was out The Danish there, cartoons. The Danish cartoons. Once it had happened, you had to defend the right to publish it, but um, uh, you could have, you know, well done without that. Um, it was a kind of double insult in the... Sunni Islam forbids representation, let alone representation of the Prophet. 
Um, the question of veils, I know it's difficult, but my instinct is to have nothing to do with that. It's none of my business whether people wear veils or not, although I see there are legal complications. But to step back from it, we can see that, um, that religion, and above all, skin color, strangles all, uh, all, all freedom of discussion on this question, that the racist card trumps all the others uh, by a great distance, and we're all very inhibited about it. Just a few seconds ago, five seconds ago, how excited you are, are you about the Obama presidency? Uh, uh, ecstatically excited. Time is up. It's really nice to meet you. <laughs>